Thank you. Um, welcome. I'm Jeff Tittle, director of New Jersey Sierra Club, and uh, I just want to welcome all our members and friends and other guests. Um, tonight, we're going to be talking about um, Bakken oil and the threat that it has to the environment, whether it's delivered by train, barge, um, or pipeline. Uh, but also what we can do instead of going down the fossil foolishness of the past and move towards a clean energy future. Because I think it's not about just saying no, it's about where we can say yes and where we can build for a future. Um, the Sierra Club is not only the nation's oldest and largest environmental group, uh, founded by John Muir in 1892 and the organization that came up with the idea of national parks, but we also work on many other issues. The Sierra Club as an organization is pro-choice. We oppose the Iraq war. Uh, we support prevailing wage and the $15 minimum wage where we're supporting the New Jersey legislature. We also believe in just transition. But more importantly, we also believe that this planet is at risk and that it's not about right now and today, it's about our future. There is a climate time bomb that is ticking. And we see that on a daily basis. We see it when ski areas in New Jersey that for generations operated now are closed. We see it when we see southern pine beetle coming up and destroying our forests that never used to survive a winter. We see it when we see storms along our coast, uh, like Superstorm Sandy and the $60 billion in damage it did to the New York metropolitan area. We also see it on a normal full moon down the shore when roads go underwater. At high tide on a daily basis, Long Beach Island, there's fish swimming in the storm drains. We see it because of the drought in California and the massive dislocation that's caused environmentally there and also with our food sources. We see it around the world. I was part of a panel that sh that, um, at Tulane University that talked about what was happening in different parts of the planet, where there are houses now in Bangladesh that are built on floats because they used to be dry land, but that land is disappearing. Uh, we see it on the Delaware Bay Shore, where a football field a year of wetlands is going underwater and disappearing. Make no mistake about it, we are at that tipping point. And what happens now and in the future is going to have a direct impact on this planet. According to Rutgers University and NOAA, the National Oceanographic Administration, Administration, if we don't do something about climate change, within the next generation, 50 years, 9% of New Jersey will disappear. Areas that are already seeing those impacts are some of the most important infrastructure we have in New Jersey. Port Newark, Newark Airport, um, in fact, the military has been on the cutting edge because they're afraid that many of their naval bases, such as Earl or Portsmouth, are going to go underwater and we're going to lose access to some of the most important parts of our defense. So this is not just about do-gooders and people who drive Priuses. This is about the future of our planet. When we talk about New Jersey, 120 sewer plants were knocked out during Hurricane Sandy. The Passaic Valley sewage plant was discharging more than a half a million gallons of sewage that was raw into our waterways because of Hurricane Sandy a day. So this is not some esoteric thing. You know, when we look at the Meadowlands, Meadowlands, you know, are one of the most vulnerable areas in the state and, you know, we've got major infrastructure and economic going, going on there. And you know, the line that I always say is that one day when the Giants are playing the Dolphins at MetLife Station, Stadium, they could be real Dolphins. So this is real. But there's also another side. The other side of it is that we can move this planet forward and we can move the state forward. Governor Christie for six years has blocked the regulations for offshore wind. $10 billion of economic investment, 6,000 jobs because he's held captive to those fossil fools in Washington and the Tea Party types. If those rules were, were put in place, the federal government has already leased out 3,500 
um, megawatts of offshore wind. That's one third of New Jersey's electrical generation. Could be done by wind. New Jersey, before Christie, was second in the nation in solar. We're now fourth in what's installed, but on a monthly basis, we're down to eighth. New Jersey was seventh in the nation in energy efficiency. We're now 22nd. Every year to balance the budget, the governor is stealing $200 million out of the Clean Energy Fund, which is, <coughs> which is on, your tax, on your energy bill every day. That represents 4,000 jobs a year. It represents 180 million tons of CO2 per year that could be reduced. When the governor pulled us out of Reggie, Reggie produced 60 million a year, 1,800 jobs, and 18 million tons of reduced reductions in greenhouse gases. So the point I'm making is that we have a future that can create good jobs, a good economy, while reducing greenhouse gases. The reason the governor pulled out of Reggie, I always thought, is that he was afraid he'd be regulated as New Jersey's largest source of hot air. <laughs> but, you know, that's just the big picture. We're here today to talk about Pilgrim Pipeline and its potential impact uh, to the environment and to the state of New Jersey. And for most people who've been following it, this may be a little redundant, but it would carry it would carry over 400,000 barrels of Bakken crude um, a day from Albany down to Sea Warren and Linden. What's really interesting about it is that Bakken crude is highly volatile and highly explosive, more so than gasoline. And the irony is, in North Dakota, if they transship it across state, they have to remove the aromatics but not when they ship it interstate. Because by shipping it interstate, it's actually cheaper for the oil companies, putting us at risk than actually having to remove it up in North Dakota. The other thing that's interesting is that the owners of the Pilgrim Pipeline, who are very much connected to the Koch brothers, are not even a member of, American, of the American Petroleum Institute or the Petroleum Council. Um, which I find sort of interesting, and that the largest refinery in New Jersey doesn't even want to transship their materials. ConocoPhillips has said no. So why are they trying to build it? What's this all about? Um, and again, this is just, these are not, this just happened a week ago, a little over a week ago in Oregon in the Columbia River Gorge, one of the most scenic places in the country. And this was in uh, Lagak Megantic three years ago when a whole town was dis got destroyed. 47 people died. Every day we see these pipe bombs on wheels going through our communities, uh, going up through the most densely po populated parts of the United States in the Northeast Corridor. The only thing denser than the New Jersey population are the politicians that don't get it. This stuff's dangerous. It does not belong going past Trenton or Teaneck or Linden or Woodbridge or any of the other places. But this is the area where they want to go after it. That's the Wanaku Reservoir. My family's been there for three generations in the town of Ringwood. That reservoir is the largest source of drinking water in the state of New Jersey. Two and a half million people a day get their drinking water out of that reservoir. The water from that reservoir feeds places like Bayonne, Newark, Montclair, Patterson, Passaic, there's the Ramapo River, small little river. That little river provides drinking water for 640,000 people a day. That's how much water comes out of there. Between these two places, that's 50% of Bergen County's water, that's 50%, that's 50% it's 70 of Passaic's County water, 50% of Essex County water, 50% of Hudson's County water. It's also critical to our industry because the water in the highlands provides the drinking water, not just for all the people. Five and a half, six million people get some water out of the highlands. But it also provides the water for New Jersey's three largest industries. It provides the drinking water for pharmaceuticals, tourism, and food processing. Highlands water makes everything 
in New Jersey's economy move from M&M's to Manischewitz Matzah, from Budweiser to Tylenol comes out of that water. And so when that water is threatened, it threatens our economy and it threatens the brewery worker jobs in Newark or the candy maker, which is also a union confectionery union job in Hackenstown. And that's why what happens here is so critical. This is the worst place in the world to put a pipeline. If you think about it this way, one quart of oil contaminates a million gallons of water. That's not my statistics, those are EPA statistics. So one spill, whether it's a tanker car going into Oradell Reservoir, one car, 22,000 gallons, will destroy that reservoir for months. A rupture in that pipeline up on the Ramapo Ridge would destroy that reservoir and close off water supply for months. And again, the impact to the environment um, from building a pipeline is not, it's, it's not benign. There are serious consequences in the construction alone. The clear cutting of forests, the crossing of streams, the drilling under wetlands. When the Tennessee gas pipeline was built up in West Milford, there was a heavy rain and the mud that came off the side of that mountain filled up Lake Lookout, destroyed Barefoot Waters, which were public waters, uh, above the North water supply. And, you know, the DEP came out and cited, the, you know, for the violations. But who cares? The people on Lake Lookout couldn't swim in their lake for two or three years because it was a mud puddle. You get impacts from sedimentation and erosion. Um, and again, when you're crossing all these rivers, whether it's the Passaic or Ramapo, you get impacts from the construction, you get impacts afterwards. Also, the chemicals that are used in drilling um, are also part of it. Uh, but more importantly, it's the erosion. And if, in this case, with a gas pipeline, if there's a rupture, yeah, there'll be an explosion. But if it's an oil pipeline, if it's an oil pipeline, you can have serious consequences. Up in North Dakota, one leak for months took out the water supply to Fargo, North Dakota. So that's what it's all about. There's also other impacts where these pipelines go, air pollution, because this is not just going through the woods here, it's also going through densely populated communities in Roselle and Scotch Plains and others. And so it's gonna be in people's backyards. And they're going to, even if the pipe is perfectly safe, they're going to be breathing what's being vented from them. And that's going to have an impact on their life as well and their, and their health. This is the Bridger one in Montana, 50,000 gallons of the Yellowstone River. Closed, that, closed three towns' water supply intakes for months. And they had no other sources of water. They had to truck it in by buffalo. So again, a 3,000 gallon spill here would wipe out 12 billion gallons or something bigger than the Oradell Reservoir uh, and the Monksville Reservoir combined. And that's just a small spill. Um, another problem is the lack of oversight. We have in this country hundreds of thousands of miles of pipelines. There are 15 major pipelines in New Jersey alone. Yet, for a nation that's crisscrossed with all these miles of pipelines, there's 135 inspectors. The rules also, depending on where you are, where you have shutoff valves can be five miles away. They don't have to be set very close together. The automatic systems sometimes work, sometimes don't work, but in many areas, especially rural areas, like you have from Albany down through here, not only don't you have to have cutoffs every so many, five miles or more, in some cases, you don't even have to have elect electronic monitors. And even if you do, by the time they get to the spill or the break, it could take hours. And meanwhile, thousands of gallons of oil could sweep out. And that's what it's about. And there have been problems every time there's been an independent audit showing games being played by pipeline operators, getting around inspections, getting around monitoring. So 
that's why just go on the paper go go on Google just put in pipeline spills or accidents you're gonna see one a month go on rail car accidents you're gonna see about one a month those are mostly minor ones but they're serious ones every few months it happens all along Arkansas Texas go down the list with Bach and crude there's been spill after spill a pipeline down in Arkansas ruptured under a community they had tens of thousands of gallons of, of oil seeping up into their yards into their homes and the point that we're trying to make is no matter how you ship it a barge on the Hudson River if it spills will wipe out New Jersey's fisheries or if it's upstate will wipe out their water supply a rail car is just a ticking time bomb and the pipelines themselves will leak and they leak regularly the Alaskan pipeline is checked every day up and down for leaks and it's always leaking because separations and joints from weather changes and things like that so there will be there will be leaks there will be spillage just on daily operations without anything major happening even if it's built perfectly there will be leaks at the seams and joints on a regular basis so I wanted to just give a couple of things here that Sierra Club with a bunch of other organizations filled help form coalition against the Pilgrim pipeline 28 out of 28 towns along its route and five counties came out against it and these are not towns that are full of tree huggers necessarily or you know it's because of the threat to the water supply whether it's the buried valley aquifer in Chatham or crossing the Ramapo River that's where the concern lies and the safety concerns and one of the things we have found that between the towns throughout New Jersey no one is saying oh ship it by rail don't build a pipeline in the towns that have the rail lines no one's saying go build a pipeline everybody gets it this stuff is unsafe at any speed and we'll be uh, talking later Princeton Hydro is going to put on a, um, a slideshow talking about the environmental impacts and things that can be done um, but anyway so we're going to talk a little bit on a broad view about the different agencies that are involved and what um, has to be done in order for this pipeline to move forward so this pipeline is cutting through more than a hundred different pieces of publicly preserved open space we got up to about 120 but I think it's higher because we don't have you know some of the farmland and some of the deed restricted properties those were lands that were bought by taxpayer money that are held in the public trust for all of us whether it's the Ramapo Reservation or Troy Meadow or Great Peace Meadow or many of the other important parks um, and nature areas that we have spent millions of dollars saving they'll, they'll also have to deal with the watershed moratorium commission and the state house well first the state house commission on the green acres issue the watershed moratorium commission because they actually want to go through watershed lands in different places along the route these are lands near our reservoirs and above water supply intakes this is an area that has especially in the highlands a lot of state and federal endangered species from bob turtle to swamp pink uh, to, and bald eagle uh, there's bald eagles right along the Ramapo today they weren't there a generation ago but now they are um, cuts through the highlands and through the preservation area an area that was set aside for future generations to protect that drinking water that we need in New Jersey and again based on the highlands rules they don't meet an exemption they're not a public utility they're a private hazardous materials carrier they can that pipeline should not be allowed to touch the highlands at all based on the highlands act and on the fact that it's going through the preservation area the most environmentally sensitive areas we have in new jersey and the most important for water supply as well as the highlands council this is a private pipeline this is not a utility this does not come under FERC local ordinances apply they also do not have the right of eminent domain which is something that's important for everyone to know so you can deny them coming on your property you can deny them survey even if they have that right that you can still deny it because it's your property and that's critical um, towns have a right to regulate these pipelines they have a right to say 
where they can or cannot go in their communities, and they may even have a right to ban them outright. But more importantly, they do not have the right of eminent domain. Only FERC can give it to an interstate pipeline for gas. Under New Jersey law, utilities can get that right from the BPU. They are not a public utility. They do not meet that definition. Consistency with the Coastal Zone Management Act. People don't realize all of New Jersey comes under the coastal zone, except for High Point State Park, because we all drain to the ocean. That's another federal law that comes into play. And many of these streams and wetlands that are crossing are of the highest quality, what are called Category 1 streams, that have anti-degradation requirements. In the highlands, the groundwater and and the highland streams have a non-degradation requirement, which is even higher, which means no measurable change in water quality. You stick a pipeline through that stream, the thermal pollution alone violates the clean water standards. The siltation and runoff from cutting through those steep slopes in those mountains in the highlands will cause, again, to violate water quality standards. And when it's cutting through other parts of New Jersey, those important wetlands in Troy Meadow or Great Peace Meadow, or cutting through the Berry Valley Aquifer near the Great Swamp in Chatham. Again, all were designed by generations of regulators and government to say these are not areas that are appropriate for this kind of de development. That's why we passed the Highlands Act and the Freshwater Wetlands Act and the Clean Water Act and the Endangered Species Act, because these are the areas that we're supposed to limit this type of development. This is not a place for a heavy industrial pipeline. And this is just a list of some of the different DEP regulations that they have to deal with. Now, under a normal administration, a normal time, I would say, based on the 401 water quality certificate, given the impacts, the DEP should turn them down before they even make an application. Mm -hmm. Given the wetlands issues, stream encroachment issues, flood hazard, again, the flooding issues on the Passaic River, all these other things here, this, this project should be a no-brainer. Problem is we have a governor who cares more about um, being on Trump's bus than he cares about what's happening to New Jersey's economy or environment or anything else. Uh, but that's, I just wanted to give that list of just to show you some of the hurdles because, because these are the choke points on this pipeline. These are the areas where we can slow down or stop this pipeline because the waters of New Jersey belong to all of us. The public open space belongs to all of us. It's not been set aside for future generations to be destroyed by Pilgrim Pipeline. Seventy percent of the people, and we've been involved down with the Pennies Pipeline, we went in there early and we educated. Seventy percent of the people along the route said no, would not let them on their land to do surveying. They can't get enough information to FERC and they can't get enough, the pipeline company cannot get enough information to the DEP. And that's why saying no for surveying, saying no to access on your property uh, is important because they cannot do the studies to do the kind of reviews they need to do and, and analysis to go out and get their permits. And that's why with Bergen County did, after they said no to the pipeline, letting them go in and survey, undermines the whole purpose of saying no. Mercer County had said no to the pipeline, but then let them come in the survey. Well, one of the soil boring um, equipment they brought onto Ballpate Mountain Park in Mercer County actually not only caused a lot of environmental damage, and there was also a spill of fluid, and then the county kicked them out which they should have done in the first place. But anyway, the Ramapo Ridge belongs to all of us. It doesn't belong for pipelines. So the Sierra Club is in federal court. We're one of the only environmental groups in the country. They're in federal court challenging um, the DOT, the federal DOT on the bomb trains, saying that the new cars, and we've seen them with the accidents that have happened, the new cars aren't any safer than the ones they're supposed to replace. So we're in court along with um, Earth Justice and the um, um, Appalachian, um, uh, excuse me, Appalachian, I can't think of the, the group's no, name. No, no, no. no it's, a, it's a local group down in West Virginia, sorry. It's, um, it, no, AMC would never do that. Um, 
Sierra Club policy is 100% carbon uh, free by 2050. And by the way, uh, there's an interesting study done as part of all of this uh, by Stanford University, and it showed that if we became carbon free by 2050, that we would save more than six billion dollars a year in health costs in New Jersey, and that we would create more than six million jobs in a new economy. And we'd have more money to spend because our energy costs would be cheaper. Because the difference is, when you build wind or you have low impact hydro or you do solar, you don't have to keep buying fuel every year and your prices don't have to keep going up. Or in the case of nuclear power, you don't need to have guys with M16s protecting the property. So again, that's where we're looking long term. You know, New Jersey, we have about 2,500 electric vehicles in the state. We're going to be getting a lot more. Hydrogen fuel cells are coming on to line. Toyota is going to be marketing them um, this fall here in New Jersey. There's a hydrogen, there's a house, I went to Hopo, completely off the grid. They make hydrogen from solar and they run the house in their car and they have one of the first uh, Toyota high fuel cell cars there. Uh, that technology is coming. Um, but the best way to reduce energy use is energy efficiency. For every dollar you put into energy efficiency in your home, you save four. For a business, it's 16. And it's the best way to reduce costs and reduce greenhouse gases and help move us toward a clean energy future. And that's where we want to go. Rejoining Reggie, we support President Obama's clean power plan. It's a step in the right direction. We need to do a lot more, but at least it gets there. Reggie will get us there even sooner if we go back in. We're the only state, 10 states formed that compact. We're the only state that withdrew. And what people forget is that it wasn't some big kind of environmental program. It was actually designed by George Pataki. And the person who did the work on it is a guy by the name of Bob Grady, who's head of Chris Christie's economic advisors. I went to high school with them and was at work for the Kane administration. But again, you know, we have that, that future that we can move to. There's also legislation that we're supporting. Um, S1707 passed the, the Senate. It's up in the Assembly. 80% renewable in New Jersey by 2050. Um, Senator uh, Weinberg has a bill we're also supporting. S3222, which we put a... Uh, uh, a, small, a fee on the shipment of, of oil on rail lines to make those lines safer and to give money to first responders. We're going to be working on a bill in New Jersey, similar to my Sierra Club friends, by the way, who passed it in Georgia with Tea Party support, saying no eminent domain for private uh, hazardous material pipelines, even though we don't believe the laws in New Jersey allow it, but they could try to go to court. Again, we're pushing our clean car program. And New Jersey has a Global Warming Response Act. Um, and it is the law of the land. It was signed into law in 2007. We must reduce our greenhouse gases by 80% by 2050. And again, the way we get there is through renewable energy and through energy efficiency from wind and solar. Uh, and that is our future. Um, and we can get there. But we have to also make sure we keep dangerous fossil fuels in the ground and transition to a clean energy economy. So I'm going to just stop there in a minute. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, I appreciate uh, the invitation to be here tonight. And I know there's a mixed crowd. I'm here from Mawa, New Jersey. I'm the mayor. And uh, we are in the Highlands. And that is our pristine drinking water that serves millions of people. You know, one of the things I want us all to think about is something I heard at a graduation not too long ago. And it said that, well, these students were sitting there contemplating their next move after this speaker had given a speech. He said, you're likely to be thinking about your first job or how do you pay off your student loan. Very immediate thoughts. But what you should be thinking about is what happens to you as a person in 25 years. You know, will your loved ones, how will they feel about you? How will your kids respond? Will your kids want to go to dinner with you? Very much about the future of decisions that you make today. And I think that really rings loud with us in Mawa to say that the reason that we're here as public officials, and there's a whole group of us, county council as well, who represent our community, who realize and quickly start to realize the impact of the devastation, God forbid it were to happen. 
the beep 25 years from now because likely the pipeline wouldn't leak in its first few years because they'd built it well. But in 25 years, we'd be sitting around wondering why did, why did we make these decisions? Because these decisions have such a dire effect on our drinking water. So let's take out, walk out here about 25 years from now. Right now, Suez, we call it United Water, serves us. And when we have run out of water, so to speak, because we use too much for sprinkling our lawns, uh, we buy from Suez. And so that works well. But I can tell you that all up and down this pipeline, people have the same expectations. So they think that when they turn the faucet on, water will be there. We've all believed that. There's no reason to not believe it. But the fact of the matter is, the mathematics say that is an impossible act. God forbid something were to happen to this aquifer. I attended a, up in Poughkeepsie, there was a, uh, a group of people that contemplated installing three casinos. And I said, well, you know, I went up there as a Mawa mayor because I like to be involved in these things. And I said, first of all, you can't roll the dice until you get through Mawa because we have a choke point for traffic. And also, one of the things we were contemplating was pulling their water out of this aquifer that we all, li all depend upon and shipping the wastewater to Hudson River. But you're actually removing the water from our aquifer. I'm going to tell you something that will shock you. In about six or eight weeks, you will be able to walk across the Ramapo River because of all the demands that are placed on it because of our drinking demands. And the Ramapo River is almost a dry bed during the late weeks of August. It's a shocker to see that. And when I grew up, we could swim in the Ramapo River, and I did, and I enjoyed it. It was just something you did. But every day, we're starting to see more and more greater impact of these decisions that have been made a long time ago. So we're concerned. We're concerned enough for me to come here. I'm concerned enough to go represent my community in Poughkeepsie for various different other reasons. But our drinking water is a fundamental, almost a God-given right to all of us. It's something we just expect. And we are in a, on the corner of expecting something that may not be there because in Mawa, that pipeline makes a right-hand turn. And it goes right through the highlands, right across our drinking water. It, it, it is something for us to take a moment and think about. Think about the impact that we were told that the highlands would protect us. To come to find out that maybe it won't happen. There's a lot of people in the industry who believe, well, you're just gonna, it's gonna get there one way or the other. That may be their belief. But in Mawa, our concern is immediately about that drinking water and everyone who served from Mawa, from Albany to Mawa on to the Newark Basin. This is no small project. We have a group of elected officials that have decided to get together to figure out, you know, how can we represent our communities best? And we've got a group and we're trying very hard to find some way to stop the pipeline from going through Mawa and down through the Rampo Reservation and on down. But we soon are becoming educated enough to realize that we really have probably one of the most important core issues of our time. We used to think it was affordable housing 25 years ago, and many of you read about that. That places greater demands on New Jersey's drinking water. So I'm just here to thank you for the invitation to speak and appreciate all of you and your efforts to you know consider the consequences of this it is very very important to all of us today and more important to people 25 years from now so i appreciate the opportunity to speak and uh, thank you very much thank you. hi um my name is peggy bost i'm a resident of uh, mawa and uh, I'm going to have to read because um, this is not my thing, speaking in front of a group of people like this. Um, but I got involved in this. Um, I live in a community um, off the Ramapo River. And I'm president of an association there of about 42 homes. And um, it's a very pristine and special place, which is why my husband and we would have loved to have been in Maine, but we can't find jobs there. So we're living in Mawa and probably what's left of um, one of the most pristine, beautiful areas um, in Burton County. And um, never thought I would see what's going on now um, since we've lived through the TGP expansion project. And um, 
Anyway, I represent uh, 42 homes there, and um, we all believe it's a really, really special place in the Ramapo Mountains, um, in the Highlands Preservation Area, which we thought was protected. <laughs> um, our uh, residents, um, like I said, we just experienced the expansion project with Tennessee Gas, and um, we had residents that um, lost e easement rights um, for Bear Swamp Road, which goes up to the Boy Scout camp there, um, to FERC. Um, and when TGP was doing their construction project, um, a lot of things went down that we weren't too cons you know, happy with um, and were concerned about. Um, the road, Bear Swamp Road, goes right near a uh, Category 1 brook that's filled with wild trout. Um, I can't go, I could go on for hours talking about the endangered species and the beautiful things that are in the area where we live that um, just are magnificent. And we're worried. We're worried about the water bodies and we're, we're worried about the forest getting cut down, um, swaths of land and the runoff into the streams. Um, when it rains, we witness firsthand. Um, we get flooded in by the Ramapo River, um, and we are there stuck inside. You either get out or you're stuck in, and um, it's sort of an incredible experience, and um, we see the water and the runoff coming off the mountains, and we worry about what would happen if there was a leak, the, you know, where it's going. The, 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 Ram the Wanake Reservoir gets filled by the floodwaters from our mountain. That's where that reservoir is filled, it's flood water. And if there's a leak, um, it will be devastating to New Jersey residents that depend on the water supply here. Um, so it's been, um, I, I was told after TGP th about Pilgrim and I thought, I can't believe we're going through this again, and uh, I didn't even want to think about it, and I was told by somebody that there's this Boy Scout mom in Mawa that, um, you know, wants to do something about it, and you should call her. And I did, and, and Ann and I, um, Ann Powley, who couldn't be here tonight, uh, started working with Ken Dolsky <laughs> from Parsippany, and um, we started going to our town council, and that's We've been busy for two years now. <laughs> so it's been exciting. Uh, Mawa was the eighth town to pass a resolution. Today there are over 40 resolutions from every town along the route. The five counties these pipelines would go through, the state assembly, the state senate, <coughs> boards of education, and the list goes on. This is all thanks to a grassroots effort of people like us. <laughs> with guidance and in partnership with great people at the Sierra Club, thank you, and at Food and Water Watch and other members of uh, the Coalition to Stop the Pilgrim Pipeline, CAP, we call it. And of course, our elected officials, um, who some of them are here today. We have a multifaceted approach to defeating Pilgrim, and tonight's presentation is really the culmination of that process. Resolutions were a great first step to build public awareness and learn about the effects Pilgrim could have on each municipality along the route, because, because while this is a regional water issue, the specific facts in each town vary quite a bit. Many towns have also taken the next step and passed ordinances that can help prevent Pilgrim and other hazardous liquid pipelines from being built. There have been two kinds of ordinances. The first is an outright ban of these pipelines. The second ordinance is more specific and uses the municipal land use laws and specific zoning regulations to identify where these pipelines would pose a risk to public health and safety. If your town has not yet uh, adopted an ordinance, it's a great next step to explore, and sample ordinances are available on our website, stopthepilgrimpipeline.com. Um, at this point, Pilgrim has filed its permits in New York State. We can't be sure when they will file with the New Jersey TEP, but we do know that they have not yet completed surveying the route. Pilgrim does not have the right of eminent domain yet, and landowners, including municipalities, have the right to deny survey permission, including counties, too. 
Surveying is not always non-invasive. If they need to take soil samples or do other tests, the survey process can actually cause harm to sensitive ecological areas. Denying permission is also very valuable in de delaying the process and delays add costs and can ultimately help table a project. We are seeing this work on the New Jersey route of the Penn East frack gas pipeline where 70% of landowners have not allowed surveying and this has delayed filing for over a year. We all know that no town can fight this alone and largely under the leadership of Mayor Harris and Chatham Borough, 14 towns have committed to funding the Municipal Pipeline Group. Each of these towns has contributed about four to 6,000 to retain the law firm, Skirin C. Hollenbeck, to devise and implement a legal strategy. The success of this effort relies on more towns committing to join, and we will be having an informational meeting about that process on June 30th in Parsippany. CAP will be working together with the MPG and supporting their efforts by funding an independent environmental review, which will be conducted by the engineering firm Princeton Hydro, who is here today to answer your questions and explain how this study can be used. We are also encouraging towns to follow the lead of others like Chatham Borough and provide some links and information about these efforts on your town websites. If you are a town representative or even just a resident, please go back to your officials and request that this be done. We would be happy to provide you with a model for doing that. Once Pilgrim files its permit applications, the DEP will solicit comments from residents and we need to mobilize as many as possible to submit their concerns to the DEP. Town websites and communication systems can drive that effort. We have more information in the back. Please take a moment, well outside there, please take a moment to sign up so we can keep you informed. If you haven't already, please follow the Facebook page which is, a, is the New York, New Jersey Coalition Against Pilgrim Pipeline and visit the website, stopthepilgrimpipeline.com where you can sign the New Jersey petition. There's a great fact sheet section, updates on events and lists of resolutions and sample ordinances. Thank you very much for coming out tonight. Thank you. I'm going to bring up uh, Mark Gallagher from Princeton Hydro, um, who's going to talk about the environmental and regulatory issues. Uh, I also want to mention for those who you know haven't followed the pipeline that closely, but the people in New Jersey are not going to see any of the refined oil products. It's a two-way pipeline, so what they're going to do is they're going to bring the oil down here to be refined and then ship it back up to Albany where it will be distributed. New Jersey has the northernmost refineries on the eastern seaboard, so the oil that's coming into Pilgrim um, that's transshipping through New Jersey will be transshipped back and then distributed in upstate New York and New England. So basically what happens is um, Pilgrim gets the money, New England gets the gasoline, and we get the pipe. So, and the, Hello. Um, everyone previously kind of gave a really good setup for what I'm going to talk about. Uh, and I'm mainly going to talk about regulatory compliance. And if it seems really confusing sometimes, it's because we live in New Jersey and it is. Um, nothing is straightforward in how New Jersey regulates its natural resources. <coughs> so. Tennessee Gas Pipeline was our first, more recent experience in dealing with pipelines in New Jersey. The DEP was really caught off guard with this one. They hadn't dealt with FERC in a long time, um, and they really believed that if FERC approved the pipeline, they were powerless. They've learned a lot since Tennessee Gas was uh, built. And this is from Pennsylvania, that they're looking at an estimated 4,600 more miles of pipeline coming out of the Marcella Shale. So our bouts with pipeline projects is just beginning. Go ahead. So my objective for this evening, describe some of the typical fallacies associated with these pipeline applications. And one of the key issues, they're very empowered to feel that they're going to get an approval. And like Jeff said, 
based on New Jersey's regulations, if they really understood New Jersey's regulations, they would know they didn't have a chance. The regulations are too onerous to get through all the hurdles. But there's always politics. Relate pipeline impacts to DEP regulations. And what we're going to see in a lot of these applications, and if you have the chance, read New York's DEIS, and you'll see it's all generalities. And the way the federal government works and New Jersey's assumption of federal regulation, it's about factual determinations in detail, not broad generalities. And we're going to talk about areas that everyone needs to understand as it relates to impacts and your involvement in preparing comments. This is just a table out of the New York DEIS, and it kind of summarizes what we're going to be seeing. Pipeline projects never result in significant impacts. Everything you read, this is general, what you see, go back. It's hard to read, but you can go through this list of uh, construction impacts. They're either negligible, non-existent, or minimal. For everything, aquatic resources, air quality, water quality, wetlands, um, forest, and 564 acres of forest clearing. Impacts, negligible. All right. Go ahead. So, natural resource impacts. This is one of the slopes that they were dealing with for Tennessee gas. So the reality is we do have impacts. We have habitat fragmentation, invasive species colonization, uh, loss of unique habitat. And this one's really important. The federal regulations, it's not just about habitat. It's those areas that are special. Uh, stream degradation, direct, indirect, and cumulative impacts, they all have to be dealt with. Um, Wetlands associated, or impacts associated with riparian zones. Regulated in New Jersey under the Flood Hazard Control Act. 300 foot riparian zones on anti-degradation streams. They're supposed to be very difficult to impact. Impacts through excavation and compaction. It's a big issue. Look at that slope. They say there's negligible impacts in dealing with steep slopes like that and that there'll be no change in runoff. Well, I'll show you later just how we calculate runoff, and there is a change. Uh, impacts to wildlife. The way the Clean Water Act is written, there's public input, there's, there's values associated with us that they have to deal with in these preparation of an environmental impact statement. It deals with aesthetics, it deals with wildlife sanctuaries like the Great Swamp, and Jeff mentioned a few others. Those are special areas that are in public interest that are supposed to be valued. Keep going. And the one thing you'll see with pipelines, and Penn East is a great example, they target those areas because with eminent domain, it costs less. So, fallacy two. The information provided is accurate. We read these documents, we want to believe that everything in them is true. And what we'll find is that it often isn't, or it's based on generalities. So it's often the consultants for these companies really aren't doing their clients any favors, because when the DEP gets a hold of it and really evaluates it in light of their regulations, there's conflicts. And that's what Penn East is seeing right now. So, um, let's just go to the next one. I'll give you an example. This is Transco's project in Princeton. And at this time, Transco was given public access to all the properties. And you can see, it's hard to see, there's this little spot right here as well. Now, the neighbors who live there wrote letters to DEP and said, they're just way off. There's a lot more wetlands. Next slide. Oh, that's what they ended up with. So there were entire streams that were not mapped, far more wetlands that were not mapped. So 
this was a FERC project. They had their EA approved by FERC based on the previous map. So all the impacts looked a lot smaller than once DEP started to evaluate the project. And then pay attention to detail. This little square right here is an additional temporary work area. It's in that stream. So the consultants for the pipeline company are supposed to understand they have to be a minimum distance from a stream. Well, it's right there on their plans. They just don't pay attention. So what we're tasked with as the public, and this is the DEP process, we need to look carefully at those plans and write comments and respond. DEP did a great job reviewing this once they understood that there were a lot of mistakes. So they caught a lot. But the neighbors in this neighborhood provided a lot of input that really helped them. So, like Jeff said, FERC is not involved. And one of the big reasons that FERC is problematic for New Jersey regulation is once FERC approves a project, they deem it in the public interest. And New Jersey's written permits that just said, because FERC approved this project, it has to be in the public interest. But that's not how New Jersey's Freshwater Wetlands Protection Act works, or the Flood Hazard Area Control Act, or the Clean Water Act, for that matter. We have Federal and State Endangered Species Act. Compliance with that is linked to federal acts and New Jersey regulation. National Historic Preservation Act. New Jersey Freshwater Wetlands Protection Act. And if the, excuse me, the impact's over five acres, EPA has to review the application as well. 401 water quality certification. That's a really major issue. And it's unique in Jersey because we also have assumption of the Clean Water Act under 404. So we have, New Jersey has control of both programs. But in New York, you can get an Army Corps permit and the state can still deny 401 water quality certification and the project's dead. Because that section's delegated to the state, and the way it's, the whole process is set up, in most states the Army will regulate wetland impacts or regulate activities. But the state's involvement in the process is through 401. So New Jersey can do both. But they need input from everybody to understand the process, understand what the impacts are, and understand your feelings about the projects. And the last one, federal executive orders. They're often forgotten, but every federal action has to follow those executive orders. And there's an executive order for floodplains. And it's just recently been modified to include climate change. So. There's a lot of current activities that uh, haven't been really integrated into this process yet. Next. So, Freshwater Wetlands Protection Act. Um, one of the key points to that is you have to show that there's no practicable alternatives to a, a wetland impact. So, any other option that doesn't involve a wetland is always viewed more highly. That is the key part of an alternative analysis. Would not violate applicable water quality standards. So those anti-degradation and non-degradation streams that Jeff mentioned, that's a key element. You can't impact those. Um, in the public interest. So many times these projects, uh, like pipelines, one group will deem them in the public interest, like FERC. But New Jersey's responsibility is its public interest in the protection of natural resources. So we have a conflict. But New Jersey's responsibility is to the natural resource protection. As part of that whole analysis, they have to look at the economic impact as well. But that all goes to alternatives. So it's a complicated process, but the federal regulations provide a large document and how to handle that. New Jersey has boiled that document down to two pages. So 
that's one of those elements of this process that's really important for New Jersey to follow the regulations that they need to. And that big document, it's called the 404B1 Guidelines. And it's how the federal government does an analysis of alternatives. Now, how New Jersey's regulations are set up is they assume jurisdiction from the Army Corps of Engineers for Section 404 of the Clean Water Act. As part of that assumption, they have, this is where it starts to get really wacky, but they have a memorandum of understanding with EPA to take that responsibility on. The minimum standard has to be the same as the Army Corps of Engineer would, Army Corps of Engineers would approach a project like this. They can't be less stringent. They can be more stringent, but not less. So that 404B1 guidelines is their minimum standard. And it's really important because that brings in all those public elements that we value in the alternative analysis review process. In general, an alternative analysis seeks to do three steps. First, you have to prove you can't avoid a regulated activity. And if you get past that hurdle, you have to show that you've minimized impacts that are regulated areas. And only last do you talk about mitigation. So what we're going to do is go through some examples to just show where we are with pipeline projects and how we have to understand the regulation as it relates to these projects. This is not Pilgrim's DEIS. These are quotes. So, so we're going to you know, remove or cross a wetland. There's only temporary alteration of hydrology and loss of vegetation. Well, a lot of these areas are forested. They'll be permanently left as non-forested. Well, that's not a temporary loss. That's an impact that they have to mitigate. So if you just read that, it's like, eh, no big deal. But from the regulatory perspective and the permitting perspective, it is. Um, to say that everything will be restored in place upon completion. Well, a lot of those forested areas, they're not going to allow to be forested. So they're going to mitigate partly on site and the rest is off site somewhere, somewhere in the watershed. <coughs> minimization techniques they're talking about <clears throat> and they're going to employ certain techniques to construct wetland crossing and there'll be no overall loss of wetland resources and they're going to restore soils hydrology and allow some regrowth now the issue here is they're basing the impacts on area so yes the area is the same but the value of wetlands as a resource for us are the services they provide to us. Those services are compromised. They're less valuable at that point. So they're not wrong in what they said. The area is the same, but the value to us has been diminished. That comes out in the permit process. Um, in reality, there's lots of impacts. 296 wetland crossings. 9.2 linear miles. This is just in New York. It's not have anything to do with Jersey yet. 29.7 acres of forested wetland. 564.7 acres of forest. So, that leads to habitat conversion, invasive species, uh, modified soil structure, compaction. All that leads to more runoff. So if we have pristine streams, like Jeff mentioned, we're increasing runoff. Those steep slopes that they were building the pipeline on, higher probability of erosion, more light, warming. Those streams warm if they're trout streams, conflict with trout. Um, loss of carbon sequestration in those forests, very valuable for storing carbon. So these are all impacts that are not talked about and these aren't impacts I'm making up. I mean, these are impacts that you can find in any bit of literature. Increased runoff. Here's just an example for a one-year storm just using one acre. 464% increase in runoff. One acre. So, it sounds like a lot, but it goes from about 3,500 gallons of runoff in a one-year storm 
to 20,000. So now multiply that over 564. There are large quantities of runoff increases. One of the most probably widespread impacts to streams in more suburban areas is runoff volume. Cause a lot of erosion, cause it impacts the water quality. These are all things EPA regulates. So these are all impacts that really aren't spoken to by the pipeline projects. Next one. Again, same picture. Minimal to no impacts. Go ahead. The other thing to remember, you know, we have to deal with the highlands, and you might have missed this, but in 2014, they have a stream corridor functional assessment guidance. So what the Highlands was worried about is their original documents didn't provide enough detail to assess impacts to streams. So this document deals with how to assess a stream, how to identify impacts, and how to identify the quality of the riparian zone in that area. And this ties into the Highlands' no net loss in function, forest function, not just forest area, but function. 404B1 guidelines, cumulative impacts is another element that they, these projects really hate to do. Because one of the keys to this is it has to look at past, present, and foreseeable impacts to tie in cumulative impacts. The key here is past. It's not just current. So you have to look at how we fragmented our environment to put certain species at jeopardy like red shoulder hawk or barred owl, which we know the pipeline is going through their habitat. So in New Jersey, these are species that really historically colonized or populated large unfragmented habitats. So as we cut them up and dissect them, many of these, these populations are remnant, they're hanging on. We don't know what the tipping point is, so as we keep fragmenting them, there is a point where they're gone. So that's why no one wants to assess past. Because it really says we've already screwed things up enough that these species are hanging on. So all these incremental increases in impact, we're not sure. We're just not sure when we get to the point that we've lost those species. Fallacy three, all impacts can be mitigated. This forest, old growth forest in Princeton, spring fed stream, mitigation. A couple of tree tubes with uh, canary grass growing all around. Next. So this is just another view of that mitigation project. They're all dead. So, I mean, DEP will make them replant, but it is very difficult to replicate an older growth forest. We could say it, and I do a lot of restoration work, and we could satisfy regulation, but there are certain forests that we can't replicate. They're too <coughs> unique. The composition of the communities have too many rare elements. We're not good enough. And we can look at this nationwide. The best restoration projects done in the country have never equaled those special forest areas. And I'll give you a description on how to test that. Uh, oh, let's do this first. This is an example. This is classic boilerplate with the pipeline applications. There's just a whole lot of, you know, all the things you're going to do and their erosion control plans are really going to protect all the resources. So that was the language taken from Tennessee Gas. This was Transco's line. The only thing different was they changed Tennessee Gas to Transco. Identical. So when you see a lot of boilerplate, you have to think how much care and thought is really given to these applications. It's really all about getting to the end and not about really satisfying the regulations. Anti-degradation. This is the definition Jeff was talking about. Measurable change. We protect those streams from measurable change. So anything 
that's measurable is conflict. But we don't just protect the water quality, we protect the setting. So there's an aesthetic component, there is a water quality component, and their equal ecological integrity doesn't just include the water, it includes the area. So we're looking at protecting these streams, not just in-stream, but to protect them by protecting area around them, which is why we have 300-foot riparian zones. So this is what they said. You know, during construction, we'll be clearing and grading the vegetative cover, or clearing and grading could increase erosion, could alter the natural drainage by compaction. So if they knew what the anti-degradation standard actually said, do you think you'd say that? They've just told us that they're violating that standard. So at that point, we have to wonder if they understand what the regulations are trying to show compliance with. Meanwhile, the Flood Hazard Control Act, you're supposed to do directional drilling, some kind of drilling under every stream, not just anti-degradation streams, every stream. And the only way you don't is if you prove you can't. Now the problem we have with a lot of the pipelines is they're on those slopes. We saw that picture, steep slopes on both sides. There's no place to set up drilling equipment to drill under. But the rules also say you can't make your own hardship. So you get to that stream, they want you to drill under it, and you say, I can't because I'm on steep slopes. It's conflict. This is out of 404B1 guidelines. Sanctuaries and refuges, such as the Great Swamp, they're viewed as special areas. With, and practical alternatives are presumed to be available. So those lines that are going through areas that we, as the public, determine to be sanctuaries for wildlife shouldn't be violated. Instead, many times they're targeted. It's an interesting conflict. High quality sites. There's a way to deal with this, um, and New Jersey's doing it, the EPA's doing it, and the Highlands, in their new uh, riparian zone guidance, speaks to this. And it's called the Floristic Quality Index. And it's, it's such a very simple tool that you can come up with a value of a forest stand. And what we're finding is that those, those sites that score higher, we can't do better. We can't replicate that. And this isn't just coming from the consulting community. Uh, the Detroit District of the Army Corps of Engineers, or Chicago District, they use this tool to assess whether a project can actually mitigate the resources that they impact. And if the score is too high, they just won't give them the permit. Or if it's a really special project, like a, like a hospital or a major highway that they just can't avoid, they just ratchet up the mitigation requirement to be instead of two to one, like 10 to one. But they understand that those special areas, we're not smart enough to actually compensate for those, those special areas. Minimization of adverse impacts. So this is the key. You know, how do we minimize effects on populations of plants and animals? <laughs> So um, this goes back to avoiding those, those sites with unique habitat. That's important. And that's one of the things that you can really help with, to understand where those special areas are. And at some point can assess you know, their value and show that they really can't be mitigated. So why are these details important? And look, I was in detail kind of in the weeds with some of this, but these are all elements of the project that have to be assessed going through this regulatory process. So everything will be reviewed in accordance with Section 404 of the Clean Water Act. That's the basis for New Jersey's Freshwater Wetlands Protection Act. Now, what Jeff was getting at before is that other states have denied these projects based on 401 water quality certification. Connecticut was the first. 
went to court several times and was withheld both times. It is the state's right to protect their water. It was delegated to the states under the Clean Water Act. EPA delegated that authority to the states. So if the states believe there's a conflict, they can kill any project. Next one. Most recently, Constitution Pipeline denied based on water quality certification. And one of the keys here is that it was because the pipeline didn't provide the state with all the information that it wanted. Much like New Jersey's asking Penn East now, they're asking for information and they, they just aren't providing all the information. The way the regulations work, you have to prove you have no alternatives and you've minimized impact for every single crossing of a stream or a well. That's a massive project. And if they just gloss over it or make more generic impact analysis, they're not satisfying those requests. And this is the citation if you want to see uh, the New York State's denial of the Constitution pipeline. Next one. Here's some quotes though. Um, you know, as a result of chronic erosion from disturbed stream banks and hill slopes, consistent degradation of water quality may occur. Changes in rain runoff along rights of ways may change flooding intensity and alter stream channel morphology. So this is what New York DEC believed the Constitution pipeline would do to their resources. The last one I like, because this had to do with something the pipeline did already. The tree felling was conducted near streams and directly on the banks of some streams without a permit, <clears throat> and in one instant resulted in trees and brush being deposited directly in the stream. Regulated activity. Next one. <clears throat> so, the other element of these projects, and we read it all, we want to believe it, these are big construction projects and, and problems happen. Tennessee Gas was fined $800,000 by Pennsylvania DEP for multiple stream violations. So you read their documents, and it's like they have the Midas touch, that nothing can go wrong. Well, things go wrong. Wisconsin, this was an oil pipeline, this Enbridge Energy Partners. And this is a picture of one of the streams next to their site. They were fined over a million dollars for encroachment in the wetlands and the streams. State of New Jersey fined Tennessee Gas 175,000. Impacts to Highland Lakes and other lakes all through, all along the Radville line. Now, granted, Tennessee Gas was lucky enough to be building their pipeline and at the time of uh, Hurricane Irene and Tropical Storm uh, so, it was a massive problem, but the regulations are supposed to, you know, you're supposed to avoid those things. You're supposed to understand those impacts could happen. Transco, they didn't do their homework in Princeton or uh, Montgomery Township, and they had three HDD attempts that all failed. They didn't do their homework with the geology. Now they're coming back with a much more impactful alternative. They didn't do their homework because they were in a rush to get the project started. So a lot of this, we, we think that they get it, but there's such a push for them to get these lines in the ground that there's corners cut. Next. One of the other things that we need to understand there's a lot of these workspaces, and they could be five, six acres of compacted storage areas. They're essentially, you know, where people park, where they store the equipment. And, and this line might be a little different, but the gas lines are not covered under stormwater rules because they're deemed temporary. No stormwater management is required. So you can see there's really not much even in the way of erosion and sediment control. And all the little finds from the parking lot, you can see, they washed down this channel and they all ended up in the stream. It's now looked at as permanent, but 
in the in the DEIS for Pilgrim, they said some of these will be in for eight months. They don't even satisfy New Jersey's definition of temporary. They will all need stormwater management facilities to avoid things like this. So, many of these submissions really, as I call it, are apologies for the project. They're not really designed to point out impacts, they just want to approve. The position that mitigation compensates for all the impacts, it, it, it's, not, it's just not true. So. There's mitigation requirements that simply satisfy math. So if I impact an acre of wetlands, I can give you two, and I satisfy the minimum regulatory requirement. But once we're in the individual permit process, it goes beyond minimal, and we need to understand the complexities of all these systems and the mitigation required for the value of avoidance. And there's numerous errors. So all of us need to look at these, these reports and submissions carefully and, and identify those errors. Right, next. Anyway, that's it. Hopefully I didn't confuse you, but. going on and what's it all about. I also wanted to touch on one or two little things. Um, one of the reasons that they are targeting the Ramapo um, Reserve and Ramapo State Forest and parts of Greenwood State Park and Great Peace Meadow and Troy Meadows and even the Great Swamp is because it's cheaper for the pipeline companies to go through public lands than private lands. And I'll use an example because when we were talking about Tennessee gas, I wanted to use that as an example. Up in Ringwood, uh, where Tennessee gas cut through and parted around the bridge, people worked for years to save those properties. And I'll just use one example. Bob Wogish, who's a landscaper in Ringwood, who I've known for years, owned a piece of property uh, next to uh, the Monksville Reservoir. It's a zone commercial, could have put a shopping center on it, chose not to. He sold it to the state in 2009 for 40,000 an acre. Public money to protect that land, to protect the Monksville Reservoir. When Tennessee gas came through, because it was no longer zone commercial, it was now open space, they paid 4,000 an acre. When um, Tennessee gas pipeline went through Rampo Reserve and went through part of Camp Yawpaw, Part of that land was saved, it cost over 100,000 acres to buy, they bought it for 10,000 Because the land is valid. We have a bill we've been working on for years that Christie, Governor Christie has been blocking to make them pay their fair share if they take public open space. So they target public lands because it's cheaper. Uh, and that's you know critical because when they went through with Tennessee Gas and Mawa, they went through a little piece of land owned by a truck guy. They paid 100,000 an acre, but on the public land next door, they paid 10,000, even though the state bought it for 100,000. And so we've been trying to get this, the laws changed so that the um, it has to be based not on the actual appraisal, but on the change of use. It's an industrial zone in an industrial pro in an industrial project, and yet they're paying as if it was open space that you were you know, leasing it to, you know, someone to, you know, do birding on it or something. And I think that's critical what people don't realize, that we're subsidizing uh, this uh, all the time. And that's a big part of it. And, um, you know, when you look at the environmental impacts and you look at the safety impacts and you look at all of it, it adds up to say that this is a wrong project in the wrong place and there are better things to do. Uh, Sierra Club is involved with uh, the Blue Green Alliance, which has a project called Repair America. And in Sierra Club, it's the Steel Workers <laughs> Union, UAW, sheet metal workers, utility workers, bricklayers, um, and other groups. And we're out there working to try to get the states like New Jersey to fix the 6,000 miles of leaky gas pipelines that are in our streets already that we're not fixing. So there are things that we can be doing together um, to move this country forward while taking care of the environment creating jobs. And same thing with offshore wind and renewable energy. And I think that's sort of critical in why we're here today, because this is really about 
our future, it's about our water. Tomorrow, excuse me, Thursday, if you want to take actions on our website, SCR 66 is up. Um, it's something we've been working on for a lot of years with other groups um, in the region and environmental groups, Highlands Coalition, Stony Brook Millstone Watershed Association. Um, Governor Christie, a year ago, proposed rules to change the flood hazard rules in New Jersey that were put in place in 2007 after all the floods. And if anybody in New Jersey thinks we've had enough flooding or that our water isn't polluted enough, well, those rules basically overturned the 2007 rules and opened up what are called the stream buffers. Now, category one streams, those high quality waters, there's 300 foot buffers on each side and there's an area called the special water protection area that's 150 feet on each side that you're not allowed to disturb. Under these rules, not only can you disturb the, the 300 foot buffer, you can go within 150 feet and you can destroy and you can disturb that special water protection area. There's also a general permit to make it easier to drill, to put pipelines in and other underground utilities. Um, it also allows for more development in flood prone areas. And if you think the Passaic River hasn't had enough flooding, if these rules go into effect, all the people in, um, in Lincoln Park and Wayne better buy snorkels. Um, but anyway, this rule is so bad that the legislature in June, through both houses, and it was bipartisan, passed a resolution saying they violated the Clean Water Act, Pollution Control Act, and legislative intent. The EPA said that it also violated the Clean Water Act. Uh, and the anti-degradation, well, they said the surface water quality standards in the anti-degradation part and anti-backsliding, it's all complicated mumbo jumbo, but basically when, you, when a water is at a certain level of pollution, you're not supposed to go backwards and allow more pollution and it's under a cleanup like a TMDL. That's gonna be up for a, a floor vote in the assembly. How the law works is that the legislature passes it through both houses once. The agency can then pull a rule down or make changes, DP, went forward with the rule with some very minor changes. Now the legislature is acting again. It's gonna be for it's gonna be up on a vote on the floor of the assembly on Thursday and in the Senate Environment Committee Thursday morning. We're doing a lobby day with a lot of other groups. There's also uh, ways to take action on our website and other groups' websites to tell the legislature stand up to Governor Christie and stand up for clean water. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure I got that out. And then, uh, Paula, I know that you wanted to say a couple of sure. Paula Rogan has been an activist in Bergen County. Just um, so glad to hear that re the reports. Is that your drink? Yeah. Let me just burn for a second. Just, yeah. just I, I usually do this when we have a rally up in Bergen <laughs> County. We have the tracks right near our house, and they go right through towns in our county. So if this were one of the oil tankers, those black oil tankers that go through, and this is to say this were Coca Cola, and I open it and there's any kind of a spark, you have a bomb. And they're, they're called bomb trains. And um, that's, this stuff is toxic, back and crude is toxic. So whether it leaks from the pipeline or from a barge or from a, a train, it's toxic to the water, to the environment, to the air. Um, one of them derailed one of the trains you mentioned it briefly in Mosier. Oregon and the Columbia River Gorge, which is supposed to be like this gorgeous, gorgeous place. The school was evacuated, elementary school. I teach elementary school. It was evacuated, closed for the rest of the school year. The sewage treatment plant was wrecked. The Columbia River got the oil in it. So these are not simple things. These are long range, this is long term damage. In La Magantic, 47 people were vaporized when the back and crude train. Uh, derail vaporized there's 16 um, orphans kids who are orphaned up in La Magantic we're in fact we're marking the, th the third anniversary of that derailment um, coming up in July so you know some people say well we really shouldn't you know have the oil trains they're really dangerous but let's have the pipelines because they they seem a lot safer people have said that to us but as people point out, they're not any safer. They're leaks, they're disasters all over, the, all over the United States and Canada. So we stand very much united with all of you who are opposing the, the pipeline. And uh, just call on us, we'll be here. I'm gonna, we only have a little bit of time, so we'll, we'll take a few questions because we have to be out of here by nine. Um, uh, excuse me, I'm asking for people to take 
raise their hand in questions, I'll call on people. Okay, so anyone wants to, yes ma'am. Uh, yeah, there's some of us here who live in Springfield. Mm -hmm. We can't get our council, mayor council, to even do a public hearing because of the Um, I would say bring um, members from your community to your council meetings and keep asking. We'll start a, a letter campaign and keep pressuring them and talking to them and, you know, get the mayor of Cranford who's concerned about it to call and send a resident. And some of the other towns, Berkeley Heights, watch on. Uh, that may help. Um, Springfield probably gets it from E-Town, um, and so some of it's coming from Canoe Brook, some of it's coming from um, uh, different reservoirs, but mostly Canoe Brook, I think, for that area. It's not too far from the pipeline. It's uh, on the other side of uh, Chatham. Canoe Brook's in Livingston's. Uh, yes, ma'am? Why, why were they allowed to survey? Um, the uh, county executive gave them permission. Um, that's a good question. We said that it, all it does is it makes it easier for them to come up with permits. But, you know, as I said, Mercer County tried it, and after there was an accident they, um, and some damage to the park, they pulled their, their ability to do it. So, yes, ma'am. There's no refineries there. The, the furthest northern uh, refineries are in uh, central New Jersey. So that's why. Um, Being a homeowner, that would, they would need some of my property. Is there anything else I can be doing other than refusing? Well, have it posted, you know, survey, you no know, trespass, and if they come on your property, you know, call the police. Um, oh. Eminent domain seems like such a pivotal issue and such a crucial thing for the pipeline to be able to go through. Um, and I know that Spectra and PSE and G have both supposedly said that they won't allow the pipeline to go to use their right of way. So is it kind of a given that Pilgrim is going to try to get eminent domain? Who grants eminent domain? And do you think that they'll ultimately be able to get uh, it? I think based on New Jersey law, um, they can't, the only place you can get eminent domain from governmental agency would be the Board of Public Utilities, but it's for utilities, and they're not a utility. They could try to go to court, um, you know, and try to get a judge to say that they have a right because of interstate commerce or some other issues. And there's case law, but most of it in New Jersey goes back 50, 60 years, and it's kind of mixed. And that's why we think we should do what, you know, Georgia and South Carolina did and pass legislation that says no eminent domain for a kind of private purpose. Yes, Joe. Would the independent environmental review by Princeton Hydro be take place before they uh, apply with their permits and the follow up would be what do we need to do to make sure we can support that effort? Well, I think well. people are doing a lot to support that effort. Um, but um, it's, I think it's going to be both. You need to start doing some preliminary work and getting the characterizations done and doing some your own field studies and work so that when they come in, um, they will, you will have information ready instead of cutting, you know, starting blind. Uh, the woman in the black pack? Um, yes, I'm not sure it's entirely relevant, but I have a lot of trouble understanding how land that was purchased for public Well, in the, in the case of, there's a process, and it sounds a little weird, but it's called the State House Commission. It's a body that is based with four legislators on it and three members of the cabinet, the treasurer, and I forget the, uh, forget the DEP commissioner, I forget the third member. And how it works is that the, Gre the Green Acres law allows for diversion of public property as long as you come up with land that's supposed to be of equal or greater value. But the problem is the DEP uses assessments based on the current value of the land, not the potential use from the diversion or what the cost was when it bought it. So open space is cheaper. And that's why they do it that way. So, and we also have a tree removal or tree replacement thing too. And that's when you end up with those pole farms, you know, we see the newer things. Uh, okay. Um, Mark, you mentioned in the, your last slide that it's gonna take participation from everyone to make sure that the compliance 
with DEP's rules and regulations um, takes place. What do you envision the, that role is for you know the every everyday person? Well, the one thing that we found doing reviews like this over the years is the residents of a community know way more about their land than a consultant coming in now. So Hello. it's Hello. listening Hello. to Hello. environmental conditions and the people that help do resource inventory and often provide very valuable information that just saves time and just helps us better understand your community. So that's what I mean. It's, it's, there's a lot of information. And I know Hopewell Township has to delineate all the wetlands along the route. Mm -hmm. Why? You know, they'll eventually have to do it. We can review the results at some point. Mm -hmm. Do it for them. It makes sense. For you to provide me input you know, where wetlands are, mm -hmm. where you've seen the native species, and get that information to the state, that's all valuable. And that's really what the public's role in the process is. Are you in the back right in there? Yes. Yes. Uh, you keep on saying it's unsafe. Yes. I uh, keep on saying it's unsafe <coughs> and will leak. Um, you c and, you know, I, this is my craft. I, I, I work in this field. And my, I'm a professional with it. And I have the, uh, you know, we know the right, how to do things right and build them right. I mean, we've done many gas lines before. And, uh, you know, we live to a, a higher, st a high standard throughout the projects that we do in the state. I mean, we are regulated through a lot of it. And I, I just well, uh, all, the believe the Pilgrim will build to the safest. Uh, are not that safe. Um, there, there's issues with wells. Go, go to Alieska and see the leaks that are happening on a daily basis there. Go to Enfield and see that. Um, and part of it is the standards. You're not, you don't have to do a double uh, pipe. So it's just a single weld. You don't have to have that much monitoring equipment. There's no, there's very few pipeline safety inspectors. Look, it's not against the people who are building the pipelines. It's the rules that are in place that make it unsafe. Uh, and we see it, just Google oil pipeline leaks and you'll find page after page. And if you think that the materials aren't hazardous, well, what happened in, you know, you can go down the list. And I can give you a list of 10 or 12 places. This is the Ramapo River. This is the Wanakue a reservoir. It, it's not worth that type of bet. So, uh, Nick, you have your hand up in the back? You'll be the last, don't worry. One of my members is... Isn't it, isn't it true that there's a when, minimum, in other words, they don't even have to report leaks unless they're over a uh, minimum, like if there's a 50 yes. gallon leak or yeah. below it. Or, or average maintenance, report. right, or average maintenance, that's right. Yep. All I want to say is I, I really appreciate meetings like this. It's good to hear what people have to say, both sides. The only thing is we're missing is one side tonight. Why wasn't Pilgrim Pipeline here to give their side? Because I'd be scared to death if I was a, a, a person that this right away was going through my yard right now. But why wasn't the other side given the opportunity to sit here and explain to all of us the do's and don'ts, or how safe or how not safe it is, because well, go to their offices. It's, it's, it's okay for us to well, go to their offices. It's a, it's a mailbox. Heaven forbid somebody else come through and That's all I'm saying. It's fair. It's fair. We, we don't even know. We don't even. Well, first of all, this is our meeting. Let me know when you and when Pilgrim invites us to their meeting. We invited Pilgrim. We invited Pilgrim. That's true. Oh, that's true. Actually, three towns have invited Pilgrim. One of our council members personally asked them to come, that's right. and we're still waiting. Right. That's so right. we have given, we wanted them to come. We wanted the opportunity, but they blew us off. So if they don't care about our town to even send a representative, then how should we feel about them coming in our town? Well, as New Jersey citizens, all of us have, have a stake in this game. So fair is fair. Well, when Pilgrim invites us to their corporate offices, wherever they are, that mailbox somewhere, or when they let us speak to heirs, their financial backers, which won't re respond to our letters, we'll invite them. But they don't do it. They're a private company with a, that, with, that's hiding behind one thing after another, 
It's not, and that's why they're not even a member of the Petroleum Council. Jim Benton doesn't even like this project, and he's like the guy I fight with in Trenton every day on oil issues. So who are they? Why, who's fronting for them? That's a good question, too. And that's why you can't trust this pipeline, because we don't know if there's any accountability, if there's an accident or a mistake. Who are you going to go after in case the town gets wiped out? Who are you going to go after if our water supply gets wiped out? So. Uh, we have to, it's 10 of and we have to wrap up, but you'll be the last person if you want. I'll be nice. Hi, everybody. My name is Bob Hapnack. I've lived in West Milford, the heart of the Highlands, for 44 years. Um, I've been building pipelines the last eight years. All right. Uh, let me just tell you, let's set the record straight. There's already a pipeline under the Milwaukee Reservoir. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Great. a lot of you are not aware of that. There was already pipelines going from Rainwood State Park through Bear Swamp, through all those areas. Yeah. So yeah. There's natural gas. Natural gas. Yes. 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 It doesn't matter. They go up. They go down. Okay, quiet then, everybody. They, they still build them through right. the same techniques. They still right. x ray everywhere. Right. Go to Bellingham, they, Washington. They, they go to Burlingame, yeah, California. The, is, the average life. Uh, age of a pipeline in this country is 50 years old. Bellingham, Washington was only a few years old and it was a hazardous materials pipeline and almost destroyed a town yeah, in Washington. Hazardous materials, it's not oil. It's That's different. what hazardous it's materials a, is. It's a different wear and tear, different friction on the interior. That's the what pipe. Pilgrim is. It's a hazardous listen, material pipeline. Listen, no, it's not it's a gas pipeline. pipeline. Okay. Back in That's Christ. what they're called. Yeah, I actually have a prayer. Let's talk. Let's talk. Did, 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 any of, did any of my fellow union members interrupt interrupt any of you while you were talking? No, but you no. Don't fertilizer there. Please have some respect. Nobody fertilizes their lawn. Right, right, right. Okay. All right, guys, seriously, seriously. I have a 10 year old and a 12 year old daughter, okay? I, you think I want them to live? in an area where things are going to blow up, where they're going to die. You think I want that going through my backyard? I've built enough of these things that I can tell you with confidence that I've seen them 50 feet from people's houses or less. And if that was my house, I'd be comfortable with it because of the way that we construct them. Because I've seen it firsthand. How about you people go out to a construction site and take a look at how what efforts go in. The pipes are x-rayed, every weld. If there's a microscopic failure or de defect in the pipe, it's failed. The well is cut out and it's rewelded. Okay, that goes with everyone. All right. <clears throat> this is, you know, I worked in Bear Swamp for months, for months. Okay, my job for for several months was to clean the mats so that no debris goes into the, into the waterway. You know, I did it. I, I can I can show you pictures. You know, they're very very strict. We had herpetologists. Archaeologists all had to walk the right away before we could put one shovel in the ground every single day on a project. Okay? There was a night we worked till two o'clock in the morning and we were furious because the herpetologists had to walk in front of our vans picking up toads out of Bear Swamp Road for two hours so we could go home to our families. Okay? This is how serious these companies are about building these things the right way. Have you been, since you're from West Milford, have you been to Lake Look, look Out and talk it's to your Lake neighbors? It's Lake Lookover, first look of all. Over, sorry. And, and, and like you words. said, Heckles McCoy was fired mm -hmm. and in the lawsuit from Kinder Morgan. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. But they, it was a perfect storm with those, those, mm -hmm. those uh, hurricanes and mm -hmm. the slope. It was just, And you know, we're talking about oil in our reservoirs. So. Anyway, but how many how many millions of miles of pipeline are built around this country, and you don't hear anything about it because they're done right. Uh, Fifty-four right. pages of pipeline accidents. Yeah. When you Google it. Right. Over uh, what? How many years? You know how many miles of pipeline? Okay. We also have to get we also have to get out of here. Somebody in the back will stand up. I'll give you the last word, and we got to go because we got to leave at nine.
built from one end to another. And watch the entire process from start to finish. So the gas pump. So let, let me say, let me say, I, I, let, I know, let me, let me just say, I, I, are you done, sir? No, I'm just like, I, I hear you. Well, you asked the question, are you done? Yeah. I like to answer. Okay. The gas companies and the oil companies maintain these pipelines. When they're losing product, if it leaks, they don't want to drop the yeah, that that leaks. That's actually not true. It is true. It's not, it's passed along to the rate payers. We've had this. That's one of the reasons why we've had problems and we're working with the UAW and the utility workers on fixing the 6,000 miles of leaky pipes in New Jersey because the utilities, the gas that escapes from a leak is actually a pass along to the rate base. And then we're trying to get them instead to invest uh, up, to, up to $4 billion in New Jersey to fix the 6,000 miles of pipes that are already leaking before we build new pipes. So that's something you should know. Anyway, we gotta be out of here at nine. Thank everybody for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Is this yours? Yeah, that cord is mine. One bowl. One bowl. One bowl. They're very expensive.